Hello everybody. In what follows, we want to study how to extract the sparse, longest common prefix array from the suffix binary search tree. My name is Dominic Köppel, and this is joint work with Tomohiro E and the authors of the suffix binary search tree, Robert Irving and Lorna Love. This talk is about sparse suffix sorting, so let's recap what suffix sorting is. Given the text T, we collect all its suffixes and sort the suffixes lexicographically. If we represent each suffix by its starting position in the text and list these starting positions sorted with respect to the lexicographic order of its respective suffix in an array, we get the suffix array. The suffix array is often accompanied by the LCP array, which store the length of the longest common prefix or shortly LCP between adjacent suffixes. We can compute both arrays in linear time and linear number of words of space, where n is the length of the text t. In our setting, we focus on suffixes that start at positions p1 to pm. So in this uh, figure here, suffix is starting at the positions p1, p2, and p3. And we're only interested in the order of that suffixes. And this is already given by the so-called sparse suffix array. And analogously, we can define the so-called sparse LCP array, meaning that it stores the LCPs between adjacent suffixes adjacent within the sparse suffix array. We additionally assume that these positions come in in a dynamic order. So this means that they come in online and arbitrary. So here P1 arrives and we just store it. But when P2 arrives, then we issue an LCE query. So we query for the longest common prefix between the suffixes starting at the positions P1 and P2, which gives us these orange arrows and we can collect the compared characters in this orange variable C. And this determines the LCE or the LCP between those two suffixes. And the character after the LCE is a mismatching character pair. And this mismatching character pair determines the order between P1 and P2. Next, assume that another position arrives. Then we again want to figure out what is the order between P3 and the already ordered suffixes starting at the positions P1 and P2. So again, we do an LCE query, which determines uh, the order of P3. But the question is, how do we represent or store this order? And for that, Irving and Love presented a data structure called suffix binary search tree or SBST which is a binary search tree representation that each node represents a position PI, one of these positions where a suffix has to sort, which is stored in the top of each node. Then there is a flag, which is either L, R, or bottom, which is stored on uh, the lower right part. And it, each node stores the LCE with an ancestor, which is stored in the lower left part. As a running example in this talk, we take a text of 15 characters. It's a random DNA string. And we focus on the whole suffix array and the whole SCP array. Uh, you can just omit some values and get a sparse representation. But to get a more complete example, I choose to take the full ones. And in this talk, I also need the inverse suffix array, which I abbreviate by ESA. So our problem definition is, given um, this tree, how can we compute the LCP array? For the suffix array, it's actually easy by doing an in-order traversal, which can be conducted in, in time linear to the number of nodes. So you start at the root, and then you find uh, two. Two has no left child, so you report two, then descend, find 14, 6, 3, 15. 
then go up, report 1, and then recursively descend on the right subtree of 1. And if you look at the suffix area, we have already extracted um, this interval. Doing the same with these LZE values does not give us the LZP array, unfortunately. So we have to look at what has been stored there. To understand what, what has been stored, we need some definitions. And uh, the first definition are the closest left and right ancestors. So given a note V, um, we have the notions of clay and cray. Clay like clay soil and cray like crayfish. Clay is the lowest node having V as a descendant in its left subtree. You can see here that W is the clay of V, and on the right side, U is the clay of V, meaning that uh, V is in the left subtree of U, and there is no closer node to V that has the same property. So it's either the lowest or closest or deepest node, whatever you want to put there. And for Cray, it's symmetric in that you want V to be on the right subtree. Because it's the lowest node in both notions, we can state that either Clay or Cray have to be the parent of V. Now we can define what this MV and DV are. For that, we need additionally a node definition, which is CA. And CA is either clay or cray, depending on which has the longer LCE with V. This longer LCE is then stored in MV. So this is the left bottom part. And if CA is clay, then the flag uh, becomes L. Otherwise, the flag becomes R. And um, the case that the flag is L, this means that we compare with the clay, which is in this case W. So we know that the LZE between V and W is stored in the node with MV. And this is the symmetric case for R, where the LZE is now uh, stored for the node U. Okay, now we've understood what the, the bottom information is all about. Now, can we use that to extract LZP? Can we extract the LZP array with that? It looks not so easy, but let's focus on some easy cases. The first easy case is the rule E. So E means that we have neither a left child nor a cray which is, for instance, the case for the node 2, then we know that there is nothing to compare because we are already always comparing in the LZP array with lexicographically smaller or better lexicographically preceding suffix, but there is nothing, so we can surely write down 0. The next rule is R for right. So whenever we have a flag R, this means that our LCP value is lower bounded by our stored LZE value. And that's because R means that we have compared us with Cray, and Cray is always lexicographically smaller. So it's justified to have this lower bound. The next is L. So the flag is L, but we have the additional requirement that the right subtree of V is empty. And if this is empty, this means that the lexicographically preceding suffix is clay. And because um, this L means that the stored LCE is the LCE with clay, we just can give clay this stored LCE value as its LCP value. This is noted down, down there. If whenever we have an L, then we shift this stored LCE value, like for 14, it's 2, to uh, 1 to the right. And if you watched closely, then for 
the R rule we have set for seven, the LCP value to one, but now it's three because 11 has seven as its clay and 11 has stored three. So 11 can give the three to the seven and seven has the LCP of three. There are some values left. And for instance, we have another rule D for descendant. So whenever you have a left child, then you have to take the rightmost node in this left subtree, and this determines your LCP value. In this case, for four, we have to go, go down in for nine and find the relationship between the nine and the four. In this case, uh, the LCP is zero. In another case, it's A. Um, which means we don't have a left child. And if we don't have a left child, then the preceding suffix is actually cray. So we have to find that your cray and the cray determines the LCP value. Like for 11, um, the cray gives us the value of one. Now, looking at uh, the rules, then it's easy to evaluate E, R, and L, but it has not been so clear how to do D or A. So let's focus on the node 11, where we said that uh, LZP is 1. So why is that? So to compute this LZP value, we have to denote that the, this LZE is actually the LZE between um, Cray 11 and 11 because we have no left child. Like I said previously, this is the preceding suffix. Then we use later um, the proof that shows that this is actually this one here. So it's uh, the Cray of 11 with the clay of 11, the LCE, because um, the D value is, is uh, L, so the flag is L. And then we can use the fact that for seven, which is actually the clay of 11, that seven has flag R. So it compares with, with five, but five is the cray of seven and 11. So seven already stores this LZE value in its uh, M value, which is one, and we're done. So the goal is, can we maintain this um, LZE value of Cray and Clay? And also show this proof. The idea how to maintain these, this, uh, these LZE values for each node we process is to maintain a stack and uh, do a top-down traversal. So we traverse from one to 11 by having a stack S and S stores the LZE clay U clay U for all ancestors U of V where V is the visiting node. So we go down and go down and go down and go down. So admittingly, it's not a particularly interesting example, but hopefully you get the idea. The question is now, uh, how is this helpful? How, how can we extract from this information something we needed before and another question is how can we maintain this state for the first question we need some known facts so given three suffixes starting at the positions u v and w in exactly this order we can state that the lce of the outer two suffixes um, it's equal to the minimum between the lce of u v and the lce of W, uh, of V and W. A particular case of that is uh, that the cray of V is lexicographically smaller than V and V itself is lexicographically smaller than the clay of V, assuming that both exist. And we use that fact in the following lemma where we assume that we have already given um, this clay and uh, the LZE between clay and cray. And using the stored LZE value in the node V, this MV, we can compute the LZE between V and clay 
and the LZ between V and K in constant time. The proof goes if, uh, if we assume that dv is L as follows. If, if, it, if dv is L, then the C, e, CA is clay because of the definition of um, the flag. And hence, the LZE between V and clay is equal to uh, LZE between V and CA. And that's the value already stored in V. So nothing is to do. For the other case, um, v, the LZE between V and Cray is equal to the LZE between Clay and Cray. And to see that, we can now make use of the facts of the previous slide, which state that the LZE between uh, Clay and Cray is actually the minimum between the LZE of V and Cray and the LZE between V and Clay. But because we know that uh, dv is set to L, the LZ between V and Cray is at most the LZ between V and Clay. And because we take the minimum, we know that uh, this minimum has to be uh, this value between uh, V and Cray. So we can compute this value by having um, the Clay and Cray uh, LZ stored. And this concludes the lemma. And why can we make use of this lemma? We can make use of this lemma for computing or maintaining the stack S. So I assume that we have the LZE of clay V and Cray V computed, and assume that we want to descend from V to its left child X. Then um, the clay of X is V because uh, well, V is, is the parent and, and uh, the left child is X, so it's um, V is the clay of X. And the cray of X is equal to the cray of V. So the LZE between cray X and cray, between clay X and cray X is actually, if we use the substitution, is the LZE between V and cray V. And because we have this value up there, we can use the lemma of the last slide to compute this value. And for the right child, it's uh, symmetric by um, changing uh, Cray and Clay. So in detail, in the end, we can maintain the stack during uh, top-down traversal in constant time per node. And this gives us our algorithm. And the algorithm um, works at fo as follows. Um, we first do a pre-computation step in where we can augment the tree with the subtree sizes. And then having the subtree sizes, we can find in the top-down traversal from the root, um, the node L, where the task is to compute the sparse LZP array, an interval from L to R. So we want to extract this interval in time uh, depending on the height of the tree, which is h, plus the length of this interval. Now, during this traversal, we find this node l, so the starting position. And also during this traversal, we maintain the stack s. So having found this node l, we can start an in-order traversal at this node l and stop this traversal when we reach the node r and maintaining this stack during this traversal takes constant time per node. And the number of visited nodes is um, in relation to h plus the length of this interval or the number of nodes we visit. And because the tree navigation also takes constant time per node, we get the claimed bound. Finally, we can say that the suffix binary search tree it uh, takes um, m suffixes and it maintains the rank. It uh, uses order of m space because it stores one integer for the respective starting position of the suffix it represents. It stores one LZE value and it has one bit flag for L or R. The construction needs m times h LZE queries where h is the height. 
In the same paper of Irving and Love, they showed that they can represent the suffix binary search tree in a balanced structure by using the same balancing techniques like in an AVL tree to get the height to be logarithmic. And the suffix binary search tree is actually used in a paper for sparse suffix sorting where um, the C, which is the lower bound of the number of characters we need to compare, is multiplied with a small penalty plus uh, the construction costs for the sparse uh, for the suffix binary search tree multiplied for the cost of the LZE queries. And this also can be done in order of M space. Now, our contribution is that we cannot only extract uh, an interval of the sparse suffix array, but also an interval of the sparse LZP array in time depending on the height of the tree plus the length of the interval. And that's all. Thanks for watching and any questions are always welcome.